There we go. Okay. Recording in progress. Also. Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me? Is this? I don't know if the mic's really working, but it's working. All right. Great. 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 All right, y'all. Oh, let me clear this out of the way. All right. Yeah. Uh. So today we're gonna. Oh my God. Why is it? There we go. Zoom. Give me one second, y'all. All right. There we go. All right, so today we're going to be talking about uh, deep learning for object detection. Um, so essentially, just you know, stepping a little bit more into the kind of cool stuff that we can do uh, with CV. Uh, I'll get into what that means in a second, but I guess yeah. So to get started, uh, we all have seen classification already, right? It's like when you know, classification problems are essentially asking the answering the question, you know, what is in this image, right? It's like if you have a photo of a cat, it tells you it's a cat, right? Um, next, we have classification with localization, um, which is what we're going to be starting with right now before we go into full object detection. And classification with localization is essentially answering the question of what is in this image and where is it, right? Like specifically, you know, like what kind of bound of the image is it a part of? Um, so to start off, before we jump straight into classification with localization, we're going to start off with landmark detection. So Again, so far we've only talked about classification, um, but let's start with like a simple classification CNN uh, and add in the like localization of one feature, right? So maybe we're looking for like the location of a specific feature in an image, right? So assume we have this classification network that you know takes in photos of you know cat, dog, or something else, uh, and it's you know maybe a convolutional neural network, and then outputs it has these you know maybe it's a one hot encoding, right? These three classes, like maybe class one is one if it's empty. Class two is one if it's a cat, and then class three is one if it's a dog, right? So how would we like expand this network to essentially pinpoint the exact location of like the animal's nose, right? So let's say we wanted to like have it output a little dot right on the nose in the image, right? So this is kind of like halfway to uh, localization. So it's just landmark detection. So essentially in order to do this, we need to add some sort of output to the network, right? So one potential solution to this uh, is we have the, those classification outputs, but now we can also add an X and Y output, right? Just two additional outputs from the network. Um, but in this case, these X and Y values are essentially just going to be like the X and Y coordinates of the nose on the image, right? Um, and one thing to note, I guess we can, you know, like it's not necessarily like in pixels, right? It's like it could be a normalized value. So maybe for the X coordinate, like zero would be the, the far left of the image and then one would be the far right of the image, right? And so then it'll pick some, you know, normalized value in that scale. Um, and the network is, is, you know, maybe able to output that now, right? And I think you guys could all see how we can make training for that, right? Essentially, we could just have, you know, uh, specific points paired with images, and then we could kind of do the training based on that. Um, let's make this a step further, right? So we have the, uh, you know, point on the cat's nose. Does anyone have any guesses as to how we could take that network, right? The C1, C2, C3, X and Y. And we could expand that by adding more outputs to essentially come up with a bounding box for the cat as a whole. Does anyone have any ideas? Yes. Yeah, that's that's one option. Does anyone have any other ideas? Uh, that totally works, but does anyone have any other ideas? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea as well. Um, yeah, so there's like lots of other options, but uh, the, the one I went for in this example is something a little closer to that, where you can essentially have like an X and Y coordinate, um, either of like the center or of the corner or anything, and then a width and height of the box, is essentially just the solution I went for, but both of those totally work. Um, yeah, so now all we have to do is just, you know, we add those components to the network. Again, we can, you know, add some extra rules for our training and, Right? We, have, we have a network that's able to kind of localize certain objects in the image, right? Um, so talking about training it though, right? It's like, we maybe know how to collect data for this, but how would we actually do our training, right? What would our loss function be? Um, as an example, right? It's like we have this image on the left is you know, a photo of a cat and has the desired bounding box to that cat, right? And let's say our, our model outputs this blue square right here, right? How like wrong is it? Right. It's like it's a little bit harder to quantify because we're not just checking like in the in the past when we're doing classification. Right. It's like it outputs one for cat if it's a cat. So our loss function can just be, you know, like how close with the you know output and probabilities to the actual, you know, one hot encoding that we had for the image. Right. But this time it's a little bit more complicated 
because we have two boxes, right? So it's like, what do we what do we do from there? Um, so one option, uh, which is pretty popular, is IOU, uh, which is intersection over union. So the idea behind this one is that we're trying to maximize the overlap between the predicted bounding box and the real bounding box, right? And that correlates to, or that, that is essentially maximizing the intersection over the union. So as you can see in these diagrams right here, right? Let's say we have the two boxes. Uh, the intersection of those two boxes is essentially just like where those overlap, right? So the area shared by both. And then the union of those two boxes is essentially just like, you know, the two boxes, like all of the space that either of them take up. Um, and so essentially, if we calculate the area of this intersection and divide it by the area of this union, we get this value that's pretty useful, right? And I guess maybe some intuition as to, to why this is useful is you can think about it as if, for example, the predicted output and the real output were totally separate from one another, the intersection would be zero and the union would be pretty large, right? So this number is just going to be zero, right? Whereas if they perfectly match one another, right, their intersection and union are going to be exactly the same. So it's going to be one. Right. And so the closer we get to one, the better we're going, the better we're going. Right. So we can essentially have our loss function be an attempt to essentially train the network to maximize this intersection over union value. Uh, does anyone have any questions before I go on to the next part? I want to go into detection. Anyone? No. All right. Perfect. OK, great. So the next thing I'm going to go over is extending this a little bit. Right. So. We have classification localization, right? We're able to kind of detect, you know, a specific object. But this task becomes a lot more complicated when we have a bunch of different objects in the same image, right? Because, for example, like, you know, we don't know how many objects they're going to be, right? We don't know, you know, do they overlap with one another? Are they different types? If you have, like, a bunch of people standing next to each other and you have a network that's, like, classifying people, right? It's like, is it going to get them all as like different images or different people? Or is it just going to be like, you know, one giant like person box, right? There's a lot of kind of considerations to uh, to come into play, but there's a couple kind of ways that we can approach this. So uh, to start off, the most basic, I guess, possible solution that you guys might have, you know, come up with if you thought about it for a second, um, pretty simple solution is essentially an exhaustive search, also called sliding windows. So if we want to detect multiple objects in an image, we can have an image, we can select a bunch of boxes on the image at different positions, different sizes, different aspect ratios. And then we can classify them, right? And if it classifies as being a good match to like a cat, then we just say, OK, that box is a cat, right? So essentially, here I have this uh, diagram right here. Actually, I can spread it over the chalk. It's going to be a little bit easier. Uh, so basic idea is, right, like if we have, you know, like if we have a image, right? Maybe, I don't know, there's a person here, right? What we can do is we can start off. We can say, okay, we're going to draw a box right here, right? We're going to prop the image to this box. We're going to run it through a classification network. It's going to say there's nothing here. We're going to be like, great, now do it again, right? We're going to move over by some little value called the stride, right? Essentially the offset. And we're just going to keep doing this over and over and over again, all the way down the image. Right, we're doing it like hundreds of thousands of times as possible, uh, depending on, on the value. Um, and then in this case, right, these boxes don't really fit the person, right? So maybe we would even try with like multiple sizes of boxes or multiple aspect ratios. So maybe eventually we'll have a box that looks like this, right? And we'll run that over and we'll run it over, run it over, and then eventually it gets here, it sees the person, and it's like, yeah, that's a person. And we're like, great, we got an output, right? So this works. Uh, but it has some pretty significant problems. Does anyone have anything they can think of right off the bat that might be a, an issue with this approach? Yes. Well, depending on how big your stride is, you're just going to keep repeating the period that the nodes. That yeah, that's definitely definitely one thing. Does anyone have any other any other ideas? <laughs> yeah. It seems very inefficient. Yeah, it's pretty pretty slow, especially if we're doing it with a low stride. Um, anyone else? All right, no worries. Yeah, no, those are both great points. Um, so the the kind of problems that I listed were essentially that uh, you have this trade off with like stride and like the amount of aspect ratios and sizes that you try, which is that if your stride is very low, which means that you're like each image is just stepping a little bit, then essentially you're it's just too slow, right? It's like we're running you know hundreds of thousands of locations checking this. If we were trying like hundreds of thousands, and then we also try it with a different aspect ratio, like a really skinny tall box, and right, it's just it gets, it's so many classifications, right? We're just running this over and over and over again, so much processing power. Um, if we try to counter that and we 
make the stride a bit larger um, or have like fewer aspect ratios. Then we get the issue where we could, you know, skip over potential boxes. The boxes aren't really going to be a good fit um, for the output, right? Like if we like had this box and it was like here and our stride was like this, like we just jumped over the whole thing, right? But I mean, more trivially or less trivially, right? It's like it might not fit perfectly if we're moving at set increments. Um, and so essentially we're kind of forced to have that stride be pretty low and waste the time computing. So a proposed solution to this, or one solution to this, uh, is the system called RCNN. So the basic idea is, what if we could guess likely bounding boxes and just run classification on those, right? So the idea is, instead of trying like these hundreds of thousands of different you know, potential box options, what if we could just somehow magically guess good options and then just run classification on that, right? So how do we do that? Well. Uh, one approach is to essentially use classical, like non-machine learning algorithms to segment an image and then propose a bunch of bounding boxes for objects. So as you can see in this little example on the right, right, I believe this, uh, like this is the base image and this is kind of like a, an output um, from the classical segmentation approach where essentially what it's doing is it's like picking a, a point on the image and then it's like flood filling out for similar colors um, and then essentially just repeating that until all the spots in the image are filled up. Right, and so the idea is we can use um, these kind of segmentation boundaries um, to do some, you know, like decrease the amount of windows we have to consider. Um, so the intuition behind why this works, right? Because you may think, oh, isn't this the same as just picking random boxes, like not considering them? Well, the reason why this works is, or the reason why this could work is that like edges in an image are likely to be like the bounds of a bounding box, right? Like when we had that cat example, like the edges of the cat we're touching the edges of the bounding box, right? So it's like, if we can kind of get a vague sense of like an edge classically, then if we take bounding boxes around there, we're pretty likely to have a good estimate, right? So uh, yeah, so essentially like the way that this works in a little bit uh, more specifics, I guess, uh, is you initially do that segmentation, right? So you can see here, uh, we have this like the initial segmentation of this image with a bunch of sheep, right? And essentially on each of these segmentation regions, we're essentially going to draw a bounding box around it. We're going to crop the image to that bounding box, and then we're going to run it through classification, right? And it's going to say it matches or it doesn't match, et cetera, right? It's going to kind of go through there. Um, and then that doesn't necessarily work, right? Actually, it probably doesn't work for a lot of images because like, as you can see over here, right? These sheep are not a single color, right? It's not like a solid color object. Not like every object we want to detect is a solid color. So, this sheep is actually like 15 different segmentations, right? So that doesn't really work on its own. So essentially we do multiple runs, right? We do the segmentation once, we do the classification, all the bounding boxes there. Then we merge similar segmentation components, right? So for example, like as you can see, there's a step from this leftmost image to the one next to it, where we're essentially merging like segments and then again to the next one and again to the next one. And essentially on each of these merges, we're once again running the classification on all the boxes. Right. So the idea is like, it's still quite a few runs of the classification, but we're getting better guesses, right? We're not just having to do that sliding with this approach where we're doing way, way, way too many uh, guesses. Um, a couple little clarifications on this, uh, cause you guys might be curious. You might be wondering, well, if we have all these like weird size boxes, like how do we run those? Like the CNN can't just take in some arbitrary sized image, right? So usually this is done like in the papers proposed that they just scale it, they warp them. So it's like, if you have a bounding box look like this and you crop the image to look like that, you just scale it to be a square and then throw it into the CNN. Um, so that's also a little bit gross because if you're looking for like a pencil, for example, it's like the classification network is gonna be running on like a really stretched version of that pencil or something, right? So you can, might have some issues with that as well. Um, another point that I think someone brought up earlier uh, is it's possible that this could like classify the same object multiple times because we're considering like multiple boxes over the same area, right? This is also an issue with sliding windows. Uh, there is a way to kind of remove this redundancy with something called non-max suppression, um, which I'll get to later in the slides. Um, but that is something to keep in mind is that as an issue that we can deal with, it's not really a problem. Um, yeah, so this is just another example. Like you can kind of see it's going through the classification and it finally ends up settling on those green um, locations over there. Uh, yeah, so problems with this. So it's still really slow, <laughs> right? Because most images are not like a solid color, right? They have like thousands of different, you know, segmentation regions depending on how you 
define your like classical algorithm and which algorithm you're using. But again, we have the same trade-off where it's like, if we make our algorithm like, you know, a little bit sharper and a little bit less likely to just blur everything together, then, you know, we're going to be doing too many passes, right? And then if we make it, you know, less likely than that, right? It's, it's, we have the same trade-off that we had to stride, just this time with like essentially how fine-grained our uh, segmentation are. Um, so how do we get around doing so many passes, right? It's like we ideally wouldn't want to have to run thousands of classifications just to like tell me there's a couple sheep in that image, right? So how do we get around this? Well, one hint is that our, our classification network is rerunning on similar parts of the image many, many times, right? If you guys think about the way a convolutional neural network works, right, where we have that like, you know, kind of filter thing passing over, right? It's like, we're rerunning that kind of convolutional logic on the same regions of the image over and over and over again, right? So one potential way that we can kind of make our CNNs a little bit faster um, is by essentially running convolutions on the full image to create something called a feature map, which I'll get into what that, that means in a second. But essentially the idea is, is that we're removing some of the redundancy in the work, right? So this is a fast RCNN. <laughs> essentially the idea behind it is that we are taking the image as a whole, we are running a CNN over it to essentially like create this feature map thing, which I'll explain in a second, but essentially we're extracting key information from the image. And then when we wanna do the classification, all we have to do is like define that box around the image. But instead of pulling the image out, like the crop section of the image out, we just pull the section from the feature map and then we run classification on that, right? So the idea is we don't have to rerun the full CNN thing every single time, right? So uh, what does this actually like mean? Because I know this sounds a little bit confusing, <laughs> but essentially we've seen like CNNs with, you know, like we have a bunch of CNNs and then there's like an end of the CNN layer and then there's a fully connected layer afterward that does like the kind of classification on there. So the idea is we're essentially chopping off that fully connected component to it. And we're essentially just running the convolutional neural networks to output that kind of volume at the end that has like, ideally has some like feature information about the image, right? So the idea is because again, it's a CNN, there's kind of like local information, like, you know, we're passing over the different rows. So the idea is like maybe, you know, like when this is run, right? Like this, you know, maps to some point in like the feature volume, Right. And so maybe this little area, you know, is holding some key characteristics that the CNN has picked up on um, from that section of the image. Right. So the idea is that then we just run classification separately using this as an input instead of running the image every other time. Um, I know this is kind of confusing. Does anyone have any questions for that? Um, all right. And feel free to ask after it as well. But uh, all right. So this you know, leads us into a little bit of a, a cooler option, um, which is YOLO. So YOLO is like, let's take this idea and let's just run with it, right? Let's throw out all the classical stuff, right? Let's just replace everything with a single convolutional neural network, right? So instead of, you know, running, you know, like the thousands and thousands of different classifications with like, bunch of different options. What if we could just take an image, pass it into a CNN, and then that CNN outputs, you know, where our objects are and their bounding boxes and what they are, right? Like all of these different things, right? And this, this may seem kind of impossible because it's like, how does it know what to output, that kind of thing. But um, we'll get into the into the details of that. It's, it's really cool. Uh, so this is the architecture for YOLO. So as you can tell, we're not like running things a bunch of times. It's literally just a bunch of convolutional layer layers and then like a little, you know, fully connected at the end for the classification um, or some, some other things as well. But uh, yeah, so how do we get this? Well, let's go back to our model that we were talking about earlier, right? This is the model that we solved classification plus localization with. So essentially the, like, this is how we figured out, you know, detecting one object's uh, bounds. So how could we expand this to kind of detect multiple objects, right? That's essentially what the question we're trying to ask is, does anyone have any ideas? And this is a hard question, but does anyone have any ideas of like how we could kind of expand this to detect multiple things? Yes. Maybe like after you like run it the first time, drop out and 
Oh, it's an interesting idea. I haven't thought about that before. Um, that could actually be, uh, it would be something interesting to try out. I don't think I've I've seen that before. That's cool. Yes. You get the vector. So yeah, we could we could just that that's definitely an option, right? We could uh, just have two copies of this, right? To, to maybe detect two two things or something like that. Um, there's a little bit of nuance to that, but that's a it's a very good idea. Does anyone have anything else? Yes. You just combine those two ideas to say like say the vector an object and order that I pass that. Sorry, can you repeat that? I, yeah, so yeah. just combining their two ideas, like whatever, whichever object that finds yours, I can just pass that to be a separate program that then moves on to exact rivers. Mm. Just... Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, definitely could work. Uh, yeah. Okay. Those are all great ideas. Um, we are going to go to something a little closer to your suggestion. Um, but yeah, those are, those are all really cool. So the way that YOLO works is essentially that, but like, on steroids, <laughs> a little bit crazy. So, yeah. So the basic idea is let's take our image and let's chop it into a grid, right? And actually, this is actually kind of combining all of your ideas because we are kind of doing, we're not running multiple programs, but we are splitting the image so that we can kind of classify things within certain ranges and then letting the rest of the network classify in other areas. So that actually is kind of a combination of everything you guys said. Um, but so essentially we take an image, we chop it into a grid. For each of the grid tiles, we're going to output one of our classification vectors or like with bounding box vectors that I talked about earlier, right? So the idea is like each of these little grid marks on this image has a corresponding vector in the output, right? So this may not really make sense of like why this works just yet because there's a lot more details to this, but uh, I think you guys can see at least in a general sense right now that like, this means theoretically that we can have like a number of objects equal to the number of grids in this image. This does also seem to imply that we can only classify images that, or like objects that are like smaller than a grid mark, but that's definitely not the case. And I'll get into why in a second. Um, but before we do that, uh, oh wait, actually, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so, so one thing I wanna kind of explain about this as well um, is that the way that the way that YOLO gets around that problem that I was just mentioning, um, where it's like, you know, what if it's like the object is larger than the, the grid cell, right? Well, the way that YOLO gets around that is that this x, y width and height, in our previous example, it was just the x and y coordinate of, you know, that point in the image. And then like, you know, maybe a width and height of like what that bounding box looks like within kind of the bounds. But in YOLO, this x and y coordinate are the midpoints of the bounding box. And the width and height are the width and height of the bounding box, but that bounding box doesn't have to be contained within the grid square that is like currently being classified. So what that means is, for example, if we look at this dog down here, right? This square, for example, could somehow figure out that it's like, okay, I'm the center of the dog, right? I'm classifying the dog. So it would output, you know, this point as the center, Right? And then it would maybe output the X and Y coordinates of this kind of boundary right here. And then it would be reaching outside of its grid and classifying this is a dog, right? So one of the issues with this is that you can now kind of think of it as we're not only forcing the network to, you know, like classify things and come up with the, the bounding boxes, but it also somehow has to like know which section is like the center because it's possible that if the center is like really close to a grid boundary, then maybe like multiple cells will all think that the, multiple grid points will all think they're the center, right? And so they meant all output classification. And so we get that same problem that we were talking about earlier, where there's multiple bounding boxes that are representing exactly the same object, right? So now we're gonna actually explain how to how to deal with that. Um, I know I touched on this, alluded to this earlier, but we're gonna explain how this works. So we have this thing called non-max suppression. So oftentimes multiple cells will detect the same object. In this example, these two grid cells right here are both thinking that they're the center of the dog's bounding box, right? So you can say in yellow, they're both outputting, you know, bounding boxes that are maybe about the same, but that are, uh, you know, both centered in their grid cell. So you can see like the left cell outputted the pink box and the right cell outputted the yellow box, right? So they're, they're in conflict. So to resolve this, we're essentially going to come up with this process that you can repeat for each classification class. Uh, that essentially gets rid of those overlaps, right? And is able to kind of pick out the best one, right? So uh, 
yeah, the, the first step is that we essentially pick the bounding box with the highest confidence. So if you guys remember from the like network earlier, right? It's like it's outputting X, Y with type, but also the classification classes, right? And so those are all, you know, like maybe if one of the outputs has a really, really high, like it's really, really close to one in the class that is dog, right? It's like, I'm really certain that this is a dog. Whereas maybe the other bounding box is like, I'm like 0.8, you know, certain that this is a dog, right? So we obviously want the one that's more certain because it's probably more likely to have an accurate kind of bound as to what we're looking for. So we're going to pick the bounding box with the highest confidence. And then we're going to remove all boxes that have high IOU with the high confidence box. So again, I would use that intersection over union thing. It's essentially just a measure of how overlapping two boxes are. So we can essentially come up with some threshold value, right? Like maybe if like 75% of these boxes overlap, pick the one with a higher confidence, right? And we can just remove the other one. We can just ignore its classification output and be like, this doesn't matter. This is not relevant. We want the good one, right? So in this example, maybe it's this box that has the higher confidence, right? So we're going to clear out the other yellow one because it uh, it has too much overlap. All right. So another problem that we have with YOLO is what if we have two objects who are centered in the same cell, right? This is quite a bit, maybe a more challenging problem to solve, right? Because if you look back at our uh, YOLO architecture earlier, right? It's like we have you know a vector for each of these grid spaces. Right. So how can we like have, you know, multiple classifications uh, within one cell? Does anybody have any ideas? No, no worries. This is a, it's a hard question. So yeah. So, okay. I would say the way that I, I would think about this is Imagine that you, you were trying to, you know, invent YOLO, right? It's like the trivial solution, which I, I'm assuming a lot of you thought of, but then we're like, this doesn't really work, is why don't we just like copy that vector again, right? But just have two vectors, two like classification and, and bounding box vectors for each cell, right? So as in like for, you know, this specific cell of the image, we're outputting a classification and then an X, Y width and height for one bounding box and then a classification X, Y width and height for another bounding box, right? So then we can have two images or two objects in the same cell, right? But that doesn't really work, right? Because it's like, well, wouldn't both of them just output the same thing? Like if there's a dog there, like wouldn't both of them just output the bounding box to the dog and you just duplicated your bounding box? Or like if there is like a person holding a cell phone and they're both centered in the same grid cell, right? which one of the vectors should output the person and which one should output the smartphone, right? It's like, it's the network doesn't know, right? It's like, how do you, that's kind of arbitrary, right? It's like, how do we, how does it know which vector kind of works that output? So there's this idea, uh, oh yeah, so we are doing the, the multiple things, right? So we're gonna output two vectors for each, uh, for each grid cell. But there's this idea that's taken advantage of, which is that different objects are different, right? <laughs> like if you have a person standing in front of a car, right? The shape of the bounding box of the person is different from the shape of the bounding box of the car, right? And so we can take advantage of that to essentially solve that ambiguity and essentially tell the network, have the network have like a deterministic way to determine, you know, which object should go into which classification vector, right? So the idea behind this is an idea called anchor boxes. So essentially, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're creating these generic bounding boxes called anchor boxes. So as in before I'm running classification, before I'm doing anything, I'm just going to say, okay, we have anchor box one, which is like a square and then anchor box two, which is like a rectangle that's stretched vertically, right? Like before we do any classification, we just, we just arbitrarily define, well, not arbitrarily, but we just define that these are, these are anchor boxes, right? Now, when we're doing our classification, right? So when we're doing our, you know, like making our uh, data set and that kind of thing, well, all we have to do is we have to say, okay, like for example, take this image, right? There's the person and then there's the present. Maybe we're both, we're classifying them both. Well, we can say the person's bounding box is very similar to anchor box two. And the presence bounding box is very similar to anchor box one, right? <laughs> 
So we can just say the first output vector for that grid cell corresponds to things that look like anchor box one. And the second output vector for that grid cell corresponds to things that look like anchor box two, right? And so now we've kind of removed that ambiguity, right? Because if we see a present, that present is pretty close to the square, right? So it's going to be classified in into the first vector, right? Et cetera. Um, so there's, this is kind of like an overview of like the, the architecture as a whole, right? Kind of combining all of these things. So YOLO, it's fully convolutional, right? It's, you know, not doing a bunch of different runs. It's just doing one pass over everything. Uh, it is very fast. Um, it's this number like arbitrary, like 10 times faster or something could be, could be more depending. Uh, but the idea is that it's essentially, we don't have to run the classification over a bunch of times, right? We just throw the image in once, get one output, that's all, right? So it's gonna be a lot faster. Um, and with some you know extra tricks like the anchor box, some, some other fancy things that they go over in the paper, um, you can match the RCNN accuracy. Um, and it's actually it's performed really well. This is just really groundbreaking uh, at the time that it came out because it essentially showed like you can do some really, really powerful stuff just exclusively using neural networks, right? It's like getting rid of all the classical components, right? It's getting rid of, you know, the sliding windows. It's just doing everything with just one run, right? Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty cool. So yeah, I guess the, the key idea for this one is that like YOLO transformed, you know, this section on the right, which is just this mess of fast RCNN, all just into one little neural network. I, did you add that animation? <laughs> nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we're actually we're actually done. We finished really early. I was trying to go a little fast, but I went a little too fast. Um, do you guys have any questions or anything? Do you? I don't. Yeah. Just. I guess if you guys want me to go over anything in a little bit more detail, because I know I went fast. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's a little bit harder. Um, so the like just basic idea of like the anchor box thing on its own, uh, like just like shape wise is not really gonna be super helpful to you. Um, you can do things with like, you know, like size. So you could consider size in it as well. Maybe it's like if you have two things that are the same shape, but one of them is like really tiny. Um, separate from that, it's a little bit hard because also the, the way that you can think about it, I guess as well, is that if you have two objects which are exactly the same shape and exactly the same size, how can they really be visible if they're overlapping on an image, right? Like, it's like, if I'm like, oh, I might have like an Android phone and an iPhone that are overlapping. Well, if I'm holding the Android phone and the iPhone in the exact same spot, it's like, you're not gonna see the one in the back, right? So in most cases, the things that you're trying to classify are going to be different shapes or different sizes, because otherwise it's like, how would you even, see that they're there, right? If they're taking up the same area. Um, the other thing as well is that like these anchor boxes, something that I, I didn't mention, but like for like, if you were actually using this, a lot of times you're not gonna be like manually being like, oh, I think I'm gonna classify these shapes, right? It's like you can take in a training set and then there are actually algorithms that you can run that will essentially look at all of your objects and it will essentially come up with like mathematically optimal anchor boxes that like match like that are most likely to match and kind of be separate. Um, so there are kind of solutions to that as well. But in general, yeah, I would say like, it's actually very hard to think, I, I right now at least cannot think of an example where you'd have two things that are the same shape that are gonna be overlapping because at that point it's like, what do you see, right? What are you seeing there? Um, I, I don't know that anchor boxes really, will really solve that issue. Uh, but yeah, it's a good question. Anyone else? Got some time. Yes. It's not uh, too like specific for like the segmentation, but if you have like a million things to classify, does that mean the output vector you know has to be like a million long, or is like more efficient ways to be more hot? So you're saying if you want to like just like you have a million classes or whatever? Yeah, I don't people might like, yeah. scan anything and then it just knows what it is. I don't actually know how like you guys might be able to answer that more than I do because that's just a classification question. Um, Oh, but not just about Google Lens, but just in general, like if you have like an insane number of classes that you're trying to classify, it's like if you're just doing one hot encoding, that's so much space. One of the papers in the Yolo series, 
uh, and so they have nine thousand classes. They still do uh, I think they propose they propose like a three structure for for that. Uh, so you know instead of just like nine thousand different classes, you will separate it or say like the objects and animals, the animals storage, the humans and store the steps, so on and on, and then like dogs might be feet. Uh, and so then created maybe using kind of the speed structure, they got down the encoding size for 9,000 to make a much smaller record. And that way it's actually able to predict a large number of classes. Additionally, what it does is it doesn't predict some of the problem with the different color. Maybe it doesn't get the feet of the dog exactly right, but it gets like, the rest of the buffer to get like animals and dog and like one that get the so that's one way to plan compared to the nine thousand different classes. Is that the There's also for like classification to a lot of people pre train on like image that 22k or something like that, but that's like 22,000 different classes. Um, so this is definitely something that, that uh, people have worked on. I don't have any other questions. One cool thing about YOLO is that it has deep papers by the main authors, PJ and Ivan uh, Hardy. And he kind of goes crazy <laughs> over like, the course of like, over the course of his PhD and by the papers. So like, the first paper is super professional. The second paper is like a bit more interesting. And the third paper is just a few massive writers. So I kind of recommend you guys to do this. Yeah, I I would actually say too. Uh, the yellow paper is a is a cool paper to read if you guys are just interested in like <laughs> trying your hand at reading a more technical paper. I think it's a cool one to kind of look into. Um, I would not say the same for RCNN. Avoid the RCNN. Paper. Avoid RCNN. Avoid RCNN. <laughs> that paper <laughs> is unreadable. But the yellow one is cool. If you guys want to check that out. Um, and if you have any questions about it or anything, you guys probably ask on Edstem, and we'll we'll try to answer that too. Um, but it's cool cool paper to read. If you want to check some of that out. Yeah. Uh, if no one has any other questions, Jake, are we going to head over to the... Yeah, like I'm just going to meander on over. Yeah, so... Sounds good. Yeah, you guys are welcome to leave. You're welcome to come with us. You're welcome to stay a couple of minutes, ask some questions. Uh, but nice seeing you all. <laughs> Have a good day. <laughs> I think we can go down Oh boy, uh, Ashton, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> walk over there in a couple, couple minutes, so you're welcome to just walk with us as well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go to the 